there were child murderers transferred to healing lodges under the conservative government. There were. Which and ones? so they they had 10 years to fix it and they didn't. Which ones? I, I, I don't have the names, but I mean, uh, I mean but to say that you, you you do need some evidence, yeah, right? Like, yeah. but, but there but again, there were those kind of transfers that did take place. More now on the exclusive story we shared with you at the top of the show. More than 20 child killers have been transferred to Indigenous healing lodges since 2011, according to numbers provided to us from Public Safety Canada. The numbers were released to Power and Politics after our interview that you just heard last week with the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety, Karen McCrimmon. Questions arose about transfers to healing lodges after it came to light that Terry Lynn McClintock was transferred to one. McClintock is serving a life sentence for the death of eight-year-old Tory Stafford. So what should we make of the numbers? Time to bring in the power panel. In Toronto, Tim Murphy is with Macmillan LLP. Beside him, Jason Leader is the president of Enterprise Canada. And here with me in Ottawa, political commentator and former NDP MP Francoise Boivin and the CBC's Catherine Cullen. Hi, everyone. Nice hey, to see you. Thanks for doing this. I just want to preface our conversation with um, with the sort of backstory of how this came about, you heard Karen McCrimmon there. She was on the show last Thursday following the rule changes that the government announced. And I was shocked when she said that, uh, that child killers had been transferred into the previous government because throughout the entire political debate that ensued after Mr. Stafford's revelation, uh, I, I never heard anyone say that. So we went back to the government and after a lot of back and forth, eventually got the numbers all the way from 2011. And it appears that uh, there have been transfers basically in every year. Uh, and there are currently 11, 11 people convicted of either first or second degree murder uh, of a child between the ages of zero and 18 currently in healing lodges. And that number is comprised of men and women. We don't know the breakdown. And what we really don't know is the circumstances mm -hmm. surrounding each of them. But those numbers were, you know, a, a surprise to me. Catherine, what did you make of them? Uh, a few different things. A point that you raised certainly at the beginning of the show, which is this question about the circumstances in all of them. Uh, I don't think, I mean, it is very uncomfortable to get into the situation of comparing one particular case to another, but we can talk about the case that we do know about, the Tory Stafford case, Terry Lynn McClintock. Uh, egregious, uh, deeply upsetting. We also know that she was not all that far into her sentence. I think part of what upset people so much about the Terry Lynn McClintock situation was that she wasn't eligible for parole until 2031. And some of the questions that Minister Goodale faced right out of the gate were, is this an appropriate time in her sentence to be sending her to a healing lodge already. Um, I think it does raise some really interesting, uh, very broad questions for society about how we feel people ought to be treated uh, when it comes to particularly egregious crimes. Is there ever an appropriate time for a situation like a healing lodge for those particular types of crimes? Certainly not where the public discussion has been. One other thing I would just raise quickly uh, is something else interesting that Karen McCrimmon said in your interview. She said, you know, some of us were incredulous that this would be allowed when they first heard about it. I would note that that uh, apparently doesn't include Minister Goodale, whose initial comments right out of the gate suggested, listen, uh, we trust our officials and this is what they're recommending to us. And it was only through time and, and political pressure that his, uh, his position on this seemed to change. Yeah, and he, can, and he uh, called for a review. I think it was in late September, and then the results of that re review were released last, last week. Tim, what do you make of the optics of this? Well, I think a couple of things. First of all, I think it's, it's, it is one of those extremely challenging issues, frankly, for no matter who is in government, uh, because you are trying to set up a system where, to be honest with you, in some of these kinds of decisions, you are trying to insulate the proper decisions regarding punishment, rehabilitation, where people reside in the uh, in the correctional system. You want you don't actually want politicians making those decisions, and so I think there's a degree to which you want to obviously have the right policy framework, and that's one of the things the government moved to correct. But you also don't want them involved in those individual decisions. Whether you know, and frankly, that's a nonpartisan point. You wouldn't want conservatives, liberals, and Democrats, whomever. And so it's a little bit difficult. And one of the things that's challenging when a particular challenging situation comes up, you're trying to say, well, we have a process in place, and and we as you know pol politicians in this process aren't be supposed to be able to say that one deserves more punishment. You have a whole legal justice system and a correctional system that sets up to deal with that. Now, obviously, issues like this do raise questions about, well, do you have the policy framework, right? And the government's moved to change that. And I think one of the things that I think they did change that really makes a lot of sense is they say, look, these kinds of things probably don't make sense till the person's, you know, near that preparation for release phase of their sentence. And I think, frankly, most people looking at this would think that that makes a lot of sense.
Jason, what do you think? Well, uh, here we are. You know, it's uh, Tim and I. We've worked on a lot of uh, political campaigns, to, or like against each other, or at least political war rooms. It's called. Uh, it's not called response. It's called quick response. Here we are, seven weeks later, eight weeks later after this uh, this uh, this issue first came up, and finally the government's starting to fight back using the, using these numbers. I think it's very interesting to see how they've mishandled this over time, and that started very early on. I mean, if you remember, the prime minister called everyone ambulance ambulance chasers. How dare you raise this issue? Well, that me? response was quick, at least. <laughs> that <laughs> the response was very quick. He, that was uh, that was right out of the gate. The minister looked befuddled for days. Here we are, almost two months later. Finally, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Stafford has uh, has received some peace. And I will say this, and this is this is I think it's been a tone deaf sort of tin ear kind of thing because right out of the gate, I, I look back at the you know CBC had a story right at the beginning of this thing. Um, one of the reasons why everyone was so uh, outraged on this was it was a particularly heinous crime. Um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, she's not uh, she doesn't have any indigenous background. As far as I can tell, the chief. Well, that's kind of yeah. She 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 claims she does, but or sorry, the government I think at some point said that right, she did. And, but and then her brother, uh, or uh, a brother that who who isn't by blood, but a brother said that she doesn't have any. Yeah. Right, and and the local chief is sort of saying, well, wait a second, there are no fences here. Back in September 26th, the local chief says, the First Nations chief says, wait a second, we wouldn't mind some veto power over some of this stuff. We really don't want this woman in our community. We used to have a veto power, and maybe and maybe we should look at that. And this isn't the kind of thing. So this is just. Terrible issues management over the and I'm a little offended to be honest with you that seven weeks later the government says well the Harper government did it too I don't know what the, the and maybe some of those cases shouldn't have been but those cases if the, if that was the case they should have been dealt with at the time and I think you know they've just they've just got to move on they've got to stop fighting back and move on L let me ask you uh, Francoise about that point because it took six weeks for the government to re reveal this mm -hmm. for sure but it but it also wasn't part of the conservatives critique of the liberals uh, when they were going hard on this uh, when the case first came to light what do you make of both of that. Well, what I make, it's the usual comments from one party who was governing and was attacked by a, a previous government uh, is, is to say, hey, we, we're not worse than you were because you did the same, which I think is one of the lamiest uh, uh, comment that any government can make because it doesn't settle anything. Um, here, there's a few, few things that I find uh, particularly sad because I remember when I was sitting from uh, 11 to 15, uh, we worked very hard at the Justice Committee on the Charter of, uh, of Victims' Rights. And what it proves to me over and over again when I hear uh, cases like, like this case and others is that we're still at the same level of leaving the victims. And victims are not just the person who, who got killed or kidnapped or, or, or whatever crime was committed against. It's the families. And uh, it shows in here that somebody was not talking to the father. And maybe a whole different situation would have ar arisen if it had been dealt properly. And we would, uh, on the official side, and I'm not saying the political side, because what I, today is, uh, it's particularly somber to, to, to see that it's the government through political pressure that is changing a, a, a lot of rules. And we don't know if it's for the better or not for the better. The experience in politics shows me that usually when you've got political pressure and a government bows to it, it's not necessarily for the, uh, on the long run for, for good reason. So all this put together, um, I, I, I don't find that the statistics tells us anything, absolutely zero, because each case, we have a, an expression in French which says, chacun est un cas d'espèce. Each case are unique and must be dealt on their own merit. This is Do you think that a... message was muddled, though? I mean, oh, I, I to be so. honest, I think, you know, to be fair, I think there was a, a public outcry when they found out, through Rodney Stafford, like, let's take the opposition out of this or take the political fight out of it. There were a lot of people whom we were, you know, we would talk to on the street who were upset at the idea that specifically Tory Stafford's But Vashi, they him. would be so outraged if they saw what happens in the carceral system altogether. Sometimes some decisions are, are made not because of logic, but simply because there's no room or there's no this or there's no that. So... Uh, I think we have to be maybe on the political side a bit more careful on, on the reports that are filed when they arrive at, in the House and not wait for that, that, uh, that, uh, that little flame to explode because a father will come and say to the politicians, makes no sense what you just did here.
Catherine, what are the chances of that, given that, um, and I mean, apart from even the specific case, there, the, the issue of crime and how hard or, or soft a party is on crime or on perpetrators of crimes is is a political issue. It's a, almost you call it a wedge issue, I guess. Unquestionably, a one that really I think does get passions flaring. And I think Francois raised, raised some really interesting points about uh, you know to what extent the public sentiment should be dictating what happens uh, in the prison system. I guess one other question that I have around all of this is why it came out the way that it did. Why mm -hmm. Karen McCrimmon just suddenly sort of let this piece of information <laughs> drop mm -hmm. on your show? Obviously, didn't have all the background at hand. I mean, uh, Jason refers to this as the government fighting back, and it is to an extent because it is a bit of a political point. But um, and she was political in the way she described. Oh, it. Yeah, but so, so what? Like, what is going on here? Where did the government not raise this sooner because these are ultimately not very fair comparisons to the case at hand? Did they not raise it sooner because they didn't particularly like the optics of they? They are. Justin Trudeau in particular has tried to suggest that they are the ones not playing politics with this case and it is only the conservatives so perhaps this kind of pushback looked too partisan. Uh, did they just not have the information yet? I think beyond the most important questions about the context of this particular information it's just sort of a, a bit of a peculiar way for it to come out and good on you for, for sticking with her. What do you think of those questions Tim? Well I think you know uh, look there's a uh... Uh, the, the, the political tactics of this is, to be honest with you, less interesting to me. But I think, you know, unsurprisingly, I mean, I was listening to both the Conservative and NDP critique, and one said it was too fast, and the other said it was too slow. Other said it wasn't political enough. One said it was too political. So the problem is, I think, you know, I, when I look at the issue, I think the government's obviously needed to know what was the problem. What was the solution? Yes, they took some time to figure out actually what the solution was, to get a recommendation after a review. They acted on the review and in that context understood kind of what, what was going on, uh, you know, what other kinds of decisions were made in the system. And it wouldn't surprise me that as they were pulling together the review to say, well, what criteria are applied to these transfers? They got some uh, knowledge from those who were administering the system about how much it had happened before and what criteria were applied. And you know what? That's that that is a good thing. We now know those facts, and obviously we've got some new criteria. I think you know the government actually asked for a review to have some background, some information, some context to make a judgment of what the new rules. I actually think that's the way the government should work. Here's the thing, I, you know, if on day one, Justin Trudeau or Ralph Goodell would have just said, you know what, listen, mistakes happen in government all the, uh, through any, any, any kind of government, whether it's liberal, conservative, NDP, doesn't matter who's running it, mistakes happen. We've all been there. All you've got to do is say, you know, the smell test, this one was not going to pass the smell test. If Mr. Goodale or Mr. Trudeau on day one would have just said, you know what, uh, we're going to look into it right away, we'll get back to you, uh, the, the level of discourse on this would have, would have gone down, the, the, in, the balloon wouldn't have inflated. Is we it wouldn't the have timing of it, though? Because they eventually did say, we they will, did. we will, look. but event, and, and they, to be they, fair, they, no, 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 to, to be fair to Jason, they, it, it wasn't right away, um, but it, it, is it because of the timing that, that the political sort of rhetoric didn't dissipate? Well, I think, I think, here's the thing, Mr. Trudeau stepped on the gas immediately, right? He said, you're ambulance chasers, how dare you raise this in this house? And that got everybody up on their, up on their haunches, and, and poor Mr. Stafford is sitting there in Woodstock, or wherever he was, saying, when is this going to get resolved? And I think if, uh, it's, it's a lesson to all governments, and this isn't, isn't just a partisan stripe, sometimes people raise a, a legitimate issue on the other side, sometimes you just have to say, you know what, we'll look into it right away, and you solve the problem. Okay, we're now maybe we quickly, have to look. Yeah, yeah very yeah, quickly. The fact that they changed the rules is proof that maybe they have to review the other cases. Uh, we don't well, know. Well, and we don't know how many of the, for example, if the new rules apply to any of those 11 cases and if they've had to be transferred away. As a jurist, it, it's all the questions that, that, that stays with me after, after today. Okay, we have a lot more Power Panel coming up after this quick break. You're watching Power and Politics on CBC News Network, also broadcasting on Sirius XM's Canada Talks channel.